ocean liners, part one. For many a stormy wind shall blow where Jack comes home again. Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. For many a stormy wind shall blow where Jack comes home again. Many a, many a, many a, many a stormy wind shall blow. Table of Contents, Ocean Liners, Part 1 All about ocean liners. Especially the great ships of the golden age of ocean liners traversing the Atlantic Ocean. Dr. Sidney Socloff. Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com. 2023. Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Coltov. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash yt navigator. Ships have carried passengers across the oceans for centuries. Yet, it was not until the early 1800s that true ocean travel was established. Up until then, Ships sailed only when they had a full load of cargo and passengers. Because international trade was expanding, the demand for better transatlantic passenger service increased. The United States took the lead in establishing regularly scheduled voyages with vessels called packet ships. Packet ships sailed regardless of where cargo or passengers. In the 16th century, official letters and dispatches were known as the packet. Packet ships were initially built to carry the packet and other mail, but were also available for passengers and cargo. Since having a regular schedule for the packet was necessary, these ships maintained a scheduled service. What is an ocean liner? An ocean liner is a passenger or passenger and cargo ship that transports people and often freight from one port to another along regular transoceanic routes and on a fixed schedule. The term also refers to vessels designed to engage in such trades, even if temporarily used for other purposes, such as on cruises or as troop ships. This does not include cruise ships' weather voyage itself and not transportation, is the prime purpose of the trip. No does it include trap steamers, even if equipped to handle limited numbers of passengers. No affect cargo vessels, although many shipping companies refer to themselves as lines and they contain their ships, which often operate other set routes according to established schedules as liners. Ocean liners typically were strongly built with high freeboards to withstand high seas and adverse conditions encountered in the open ocean. They had large capacities for fuel and other stores that would be consumed on their long voyages. The draft of a ship is the distance from the water line to the very bottom of the ship. The beam is the largest width of a ship. Sailing ships generally had a high freeboard and little superstructure above the main deck to maintain a low center of gravity, because of the healing of the ship due to the force exerted on the sails by the wind. As shown here. Also, a clear deck area was needed for the masts and rigging for the sails. There is a picture of a Spanish galleon showing the high freeboard and clear deck area. With steam propulsion and the gradual elimination of sails, a superstructure could be added above the main deck. The number of decks gradually increased until the large ocean liners had three or four above the main deck. The number of decks above the superstructure did not continue to increase because this would increase the draft of the ship and limit its speed. Also, there would be greater rolling and instability, 
especially in the rough waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. The modern cruise ships added even more decks to increase passenger accommodation. Speed was no longer a major concern, and stabilizers helped limit the ship's rolling motion. Some large cruise ships may have as many as 12 decks above the main deck. Most modern ocean liners and cruise ships also have roll stabilizers to minimize the rolling of the ship in rough seas. These stabilizer fins are extended out from the ship's hull in rough seas. The pitcher angle of the stabilizer fins is adjusted to minimize the rolling of the ship. Tonnage is a measure of the size or cargo capacity of a ship. The term derives from the taxation paid on tons of wine and was later used in reference to the weight of a ship's cargo. From tonnage to tonnage. Tonnage is a measure of the size or cargo capacity of a ship. The term derives from the taxation paid on tons of wine and was later used in reference to the weight of a ship's cargo. In the shipping world, a ton is not a measurement of weight. Some travel agents frequently assert that a 110,000 ton cruise ship is heavier than an aircraft carrier, such as the 97,000 ton USS Nimitz. In fact, this cruise ship weighs considerably less than Nimitz, which really weighs, or more correctly, displaces, about 97,000 tons. In the shipping world, a ton is not a measurement of weight as the RMS Queen Mary 2, one and a half times heavier than an aircraft carrier, such as the 97,000 ton USS Nimitz. The RMS Queen Mary 2 actually weighs a little less than the USS Nimitz. Warships are always specified by their displacement. Displacement is the actual total weight of the vessel. It is often expressed in long or metric tons, 2240 lbs. It is calculated simply by multiplying the volume of the hull below the water line, that is, the volume of water it is displacing, by the density of the water. Note that the density will depend on whether the vessel is in fresh or salt water, or is in the tropics where water is warmer and less dense, for example, in seawater. First determine the volume of the submerged portion of the hull as follows. Multiply its length by its breadth and the draft, all in feet. Then, multiply the product obtained by the block coefficient of the hull to get the hull volume in cubic feet. Then, multiply this figure by 64 the weight of one cubic foot of seawater, to get the ship's weight in pounds. Historically, tonnage was the tax on tons casks of wine that held approximately 252 gallons of wine and weighed about 2,240 pounds. This suggests that the units of weight measurement, long tons, 2,240 lb, and tonnage both share the same etymology. The confusion between weight-based terms, deadweight and displacement, stems from this common source and the eventual decision to assess dues based on a ship's deadweight, rather than counting the tons of wine. The British ton is the long ton, which is 2,240 pounds, and the US ton is the short ton which is 2,000 pounds. The metric ton, or ton, is 1,000 kilograms which is 2,204 pounds, very close to the long ton. If a ship's cargo capacity was 36 tons, it was described as a tonnage of 36 tons. Just as you would describe the size of a house not by its weight, but rather by its floor space in square feet. In modern maritime usage, tonnage is a ship's volume or cargo volume. The term is still sometimes incorrectly used to refer to the weight of a loaded or empty vessel. Gross registered tonnage or GRT represents the total internal volume of a vessel, 
with some exemptions for non-productive spaces such as crew quarters. One gross registered ton is equal to a volume of 100 cubic feet. Gross registered tonnage GRT, measures the usable interior volume of the ship, with a few men no exceptions. So, you can see that a cruise ship that is of the order of 1,000 feet long, 100 feet wide, and with 15 decks, each 10 feet high, would have an interior volume of about 15 million cubic feet. Dividing that by 100 cubic feet per ton gives 150,000 tons. Now, considering the shape of the ship and the interior, the result may be half that or 75,000 tons. However, the displacement or a weight of such a ship might be only a fraction of that. So, theoretically, if a cruise ship like this were a cargo ship, it could hold about 93,000 barrels of wine. That would be about 50 barrels or 12,500 gallons of wine per passenger on this ship. That amounts to 5,000 quarts per passenger for every day of this 10-day cruise. So, theoretically, if the RMS Queen Mary II were a cargo ship, it could hold about 150,000 barrels of wine. That would be about 50 barrels or 12,500 gallons of wine per passenger on this ship, or 1,000 gallons of wine per passenger for every day of a 12-day cruise. Let's compare these ships. The RMS Titanic 1912, the RMS Queen Mary 1936, and the MS Oasis of the Seas 2009. This is the displacement in tons for these three ships. We see that the volume to weight ratio has increased very considerably from the RMS Titanic in 1912 to the RMS Queen Mary in 1936 to the giant oasis of the seas in 2009. This is the passenger plus crew capacity of these ships. We see that the interior volume in terms of GRT has increased a lot faster than the total number of passengers and crew. Royal Mail ship is usually seen in its abbreviated form as RMS. It is the ship prefix used for seagoing vessels that carry mail under contract to the British Royal Mail and dates back to 1840. Any vessel designated as RMS has the right to fly the pennant of the Royal Mail when sailing and include the Royal Mail Crown insignia. The RMS designation was used by many shipping lines and prefixed the names of many of their ships. It is often associated with the White Star Line, Cunard Line, Royal Mail Lines, Union Castle Line, Canadian Pacific Line, Orient Line and the P&O. When most vessels were steam-powered and screw-driven, roughly between the late 19th and mid-20th centuries, SS stood simply for steamship, denoting the vessel's means of propulsion. This refers to the power source of the ship, whether it be a reciprocation steam engine or the more modern steam turbine. This can be written simply as SS, with periods as SS, or less commonly as SS. Technically, SS stood for screw steamer, and there was a designation PS for paddle steamer. However, there aren't many paddle steamers around today, so SS is almost synonymous with steamship. Other commonly used designations are these. Most ships today are powered by marine diesel engines of one form or another and use the prefix MV for motor vessel. The naval forces of various countries have special designations for their ships. Such as all commissioned ships of these navies. U.S. Navy USS United States ship.
Royal Navy HMS, hey, or His Majesty's ship. Canadian Navy HMCS, hey, or His Majesty's Canadian ship. Australian Navy HMAS, hey, or His Majesty's Australian ship. Indian Navy INS, Indian Navy ship. It can be easy to misinterpret SS as standing for sailing ship in modern usage. The correct prefix for vessels that use sail as the primary means of propulsion is SV, which stands for sailing vessel. The knot, the speed of ships is not measured in miles per hour but rather in knots. One knot equals 1.15 miles per hour or 1.85 kilometers per hour. The term knots comes from the days of sailing ships when the speed was measured by dropping a rope attached to a chip log in the water to trail behind the ship. The term chip log is from chip as in a chip of wood and log to record in a log the chip was a wedge of wood about 18 inches in size the rope had a series of knots tied in it spaced at intervals of 47 feet and 3 inches as the log floated out behind the ship the rope was played out and the number of knots that passed through the sailor's hand was counted when a sand glass emptied. The sand glass emptied in 28 seconds. So the speed in knots was calculated as the number of knots times 47 feet 3 inches divided by 28 seconds. This device is still used occasionally and is called a log. Starboard refers to a particular and unchanging side of a ship and thus is not a synonym for right, an entirely observer-dependent direction. For example, an observer on board facing the stern would perceive starboard as on his left, not his right. A green navigation light at night indicates a vessel's starboard side. The origin of the term comes from old boating practices. Before ships had rudders on their center line, they were steered using a specialized oar. A sailor held this oar towards the stern back of the ship. However, like most of society, there were many more right-handed than left-handed sailors. This meant that the right-handed sailors holding the steering oar, which had been broadened to provide better control, used to stand on the right side of the ship. The word starboard comes from Old English sea or bird, meaning the side on which the ship is steered. The Old English term steerboard descends from the Old Norse word styring meaning rudder, and board, meaning side of a ship. The modern term steering wheel comes from the same language root as starboard or steer board. Similarly, the term for the left side of the boat, port, is derived from the practice of sailors mooring on the left side, that is, the leerboard or loading side, to prevent the steering boards from being crushed. Because the words larboard and starboard sounded too similar to be easily distinguished, larboard was changed to port. The bulbous bow gains in fuel efficiency of 12 to 15 percent are obtained in ships with bulbous bows. As these factors are significant for almost all applications of maritime vessels. Bulbous bows have seen widespread adoption since their development. Where did the term bridge come from? The huge paddle wheels got in the way of seeing from the deck. So, they decided to put a platform or bridge across from the tops of the paddle wheel housings. With the addition of the platform or bridge, the visibility became much better. This shows the bridge of the SS Great Eastern, which actually goes across the paddle wheel covers. 
The earliest use of steam power on boats and ships was for steamboats on rivers, estuaries, bays, along protected coastlines and across short stretches of water. How far can you see at sea? Let's consider an object of height h, visible at distance d. The approximate formula for distance to the horizon is d in miles equals 1.2 times the square root of h in feet. For example, from deck 6 to the horizon, d in miles equals 1.2 times the square root of 6 times 10 equals 9.3 miles. From deck 12 to the horizon, d in miles equals 1.2 times the square root of 12 times 10 equals 13.1 miles. The approximate formula for distance to the horizon is d in miles equals 1.2 times the square root of h in feet. Example, from an airplane at 36,000 feet to the horizon, d in miles equals 1.2 times the square root of 36,000 equals 227 miles. Ocean liners were the primary mode of intercontinental travel for over a century. From the mid-19th century to the 1960s, when they were finally supplanted by airliners in addition to passengers, liners also carried mail and cargo. Ships contracted to carry British Royal Mail used the designation RMS for Royal Mail Ship. Liners were also the preferred way to move gold and other high-value cargoes. The busiest route for liners was on the North Atlantic, with ships traveling between Europe and North America. It was on this route that the fastest, largest and most advanced liners traveled. This is the North Atlantic route map of the Inman Line, showing the southerly and northerly courses. The southerly course was longer and used during the season when icebergs were a danger further north. These are the summer and winter sea lanes traveled by the Great North Atlantic Ocean Liners. Also shown is the approximate southerly limit of icebergs. Due to the danger of icebergs, the sea lanes are located further south in the summer months in the summer. Icebergs appear in great profusion in the North Atlantic Ocean. The present summer tracks were fixed after the sinking of the Titanic in 1912 when they were moved 60 miles south of their previous locations. In the popular imagination, the term ocean liners evokes the large transatlantic superliners. However, most ocean liners historically were mid-sized vessels that served as the common carriers of passengers and freight between nations and among mother countries, and their colonies and dependencies in the pre-jet age. Such routes included Europe to African and Asian colonies, Europe to South America and migrant traffic from Europe to North America in the 19th and first two decades of the 20th centuries, and to Canada and Australia after the Second World War. A derivation of the word liner is from the term ship of the line, a warship capable of taking its place in the Royal Navy's tactical line of battle during the Age of Sail. Shipping companies came to be known as shipping lines, and hence, their vessels were ships of the line. A ship powerful enough to stand in the line of battle came to be known as a ship of the line of battle, or a line of battleship, which was shortened to become battleship. A first-rate ship such as the HMS Victory had 100 guns or more on three gunned X. A ship powerful enough to stand in the line of battle came to be known as a ship of the line, of battle, or a line of battleship, which was shortened to become battleship. A first-rate ship such as the HMS Victory had 100 guns or more on three gun decks. The alternative to line trade is tramping, whereby the vessels do not have a fixed schedule or published ports of call. In 1818, Blackball Line, 
with a fleet of clipper ships, offered the first regular passenger service with an emphasis on passenger comfort from England to the United States. This is a Black Bull Line clipper ship. The Marco Polo is probably the best known of the Liverpool-based Black Bull Line packet ships, which ran passenger services to Australia in the mid-19th century. Soon, other liner companies were formed to cash in on the popularity of the service. The first packet ships were small by today's standards, the average length was about 100 feet, 30.5 meters. The typical packet had three sails, the tallest of which was the middle one. The clipper ships were sleek, narrow ships with a large number of sails. They were the fastest of the sailing ships, although the narrow shape of the ship limited the cargo carrying capability. Clipper ships were so named because they were fast sailors, a term derived from clip, that is, getting as much propulsion as possible from the available wind. The name was adopted to mean fast ship by the 1830s. Their impact on trade was very significant. As before their introduction, it could take between 12 and 15 months to sail from South Asia to England. By 1845, the term was used with a name indicating that cargo carried or area served by a fast sailing vessel, and a specific rig type was usually indicated. For instance, the California Clipper, the China Clipper and the T-Clipper were all ship-rigged vessels with sharp bows and were designed for speed. The Clipper ship was exceptionally fast for a seagoing, cargo-carrying vessel, and speeds have been recorded up to 20 knots. American Clipper ships ranged in length from about 46 to 76 meters. They usually carried crews of about 25 to 50 sailors. These ships set many records, such as sailing 436 nautical miles in one day. The Clipper era ended when reduced freight rates made the introduction of steamships possible because only vessels that could carry tremendous amounts of freight were profitable. By 1850, this journey was halved. For instance, the clipper ship Oriental could sail from Hong Kong to London in 97 days that year. From the early 1800s, steam engines began to appear in ships. But initially, they were inefficient and offered little advantage of the sailing ships. The early steam engines operated at low pressures and being very inefficient, use a lot of coal. So much so that it was not possible to make an anti-transatlantic voyage using steam per we alone. The Comet in 1811 marked the beginning of steam navigation in Britain and Europe. It was the first steam-powered vessel on the Clyde River in Scotland. The earliest use of steam power on boats and ships was for steamboats on rivers, estuaries, bays along protected coastlines and across short stretches of water. In 1819, the very first Atlantic crossing was made with the ship powered by steam geared to two paddle wheels on the ship's sides. The SS Savannah was 320 tons and 110 feet, 34 meters, long. The SS Savannah wasn't entirely driven by steam. As often as the crew could, they would use the sails. In 1819, the SS Savannah made the voyage between New Jersey and Liverpool in 27 days, but the ship had relied on her sails most of the time. The engine had only been running for 85 hours, or less than four days. The Savannah steam vessel recently arrived at Liverpool from America. The first vessel of the kind that ever crossed the Atlantic was chased by the Kite Revenue Cruiser on the Cork Station, which mistook her for a ship on fire. 
but these early steamers weren't seen as passenger ships. Being a passenger on a ship sailing such a vast distance until then was neath a common no pleasant. The ships were designed for cargo, so there was not much space left for passengers. Not until 1833 did the Canadian paddle steamer SS Royal William cross the Atlantic with steam as the prime source of propulsion. It was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic Ocean from west to east in 25 days from Halifax in August 1833. Poweva. The engines had to be stopped every few days because they had to be scraped from the accumulated salt deposits from the seawater used in her boilers. While the cleaning was done, the SS Royal William depended on her sails. The Peninsula Steam Navigation Company started a shipping line between England and the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, in 1835 under the joint management of Brody Wilcox and Arthur Anderson. The SS William Fawcett started the first service from England and the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal in 1835 by the Peninsula Steam Navigation Company. In 1840, this shipping line later extended its shipping routes to Egypt, under the name of the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, or p and Later, after the Suez Canal was opened in 1869, the P&O extended its line to Asia. The Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, or p and still exists to this very day. The United States and the Clippers lost their competitive edge in the construction of liners due to a remarkable British railway engineer and naval architect, Isenberg Brunel. He built ships far in advance, both technically and in size of any before. The Clipper domination was first challenged when the SS Great Western, designed by Brunel, began its first Atlantic service in 1837. Two of the most outstanding figures in the history of ocean liners are Isenberg Kingdom Brunel and Samuel Cunard. Isenberg Kingdom Brunel was a famous English engineer of the Victorian era. He is best known for the creation of the Great Western Railway, a series of famous steamships, and many important bridges. Though Brunel's projects were not always successful, they often contained innovative solutions to long-standing engineering problems. During his short career, Brunel achieved many engineering firsts including assisting in the building of the first tunnel under a navigable river and development of the first propeller-driven ocean-going iron ship, which was at the time also the largest ship ever built. The first Majo Subriva tunnel, the Thames Tunnel, succeeded where a fair attempt had failed. Thanks to Brunel's ingenious tunneling shield, the human-powered far rear on air of today's mighty tunneling machines, which protected workers from cave-in by placing them within a protected casing. Mark Brunel had been inspired to create the shield after observing the habits and anatomy of the shipworm. Teridone Avalis. Most modern tunnels are cut in this way notably the Channel Tunnel between England and France. One of the largest British railway companies was the Great Western Railway Company in 1837. They decided to extend their rail service to Bristol and summoned the company's board for a meeting. Here, one of the directors complained that a railway between London and Bristol would be too long. The company's head engineer, Isenberg Kingdom Brunel, then replied that he thought it would be far too short. Instead, 
Brunel suggested that the company should extend the line across the North Atlantic to New York by means of a new, large passenger steamship. The idea was indeed radical. But nevertheless, the board took the subject into consideration. Following discussions and economic calculations, they approved and gave Brunel permission to go ahead and build a ship for them. The ship was constructed in the shipyards of William Patterson in Bristol. Sailing vessels continued to be used until well into the 20th century. The early low press of steam engines were very inefficient, and the fundamental problem to be solved with early steam-powered ships was that the amount of fuel that was required to be carried was often beyond the capacity of the ship for long voyages. The solution turned out to be larger ships and more efficient higher-pressure steam engines. As the years progressed, the manufacturing and materials technology allowed for much heat gas steam pressures. The heat gas steam pressures combined with the development of the compound double expansion and triple expansion engines resulted in much heat gas efficiencies and less fuel consumption. The SS Great Western was the very first purpose-built transatlantic steamer. She would be the largest ship ever so far. The SS Great Western demonstrated that the proportion of space required for fuel decreased as the total volume of the ship increased with increasing width or beam. And even more so in terms of increased length. Thus, for a steamship on very long voyages such as across the Atlantic, and even more so from Britain to Australia, larger ships would be required. The steamship SS Great Western, named for the Great Western Railway Company, was the first steamship purposely built for the Atlantic crossing. It was constructed of wood with iron strappings and driven by paddle wheels on the sides. The SS Great Western established the first regular steamship service between the United States and England. It took 29 days to cross the Atlantic compared to two months for sail-powered ships. Unlike the clippers, the steamers offer a consistent speed and the ability to keep up schedules in total. 74 crossings to New York were made. It took 29 days to cross the Atlantic compared to two months for sail-powered ships. Unlike the clippers, the steamers offer a consistent speed and the ability to keep up schedules in total. 74 crossings to New York were made. The SS Great Western still had 200 tons of coal to spare when she reached New York after only 15 days at sea. Brunel had proven to the world that, with the proper coal storage space, the new, Large steamers could very well be employed on a regular transatlantic service. The Blue Ribbon is an award held by the ship with the record for a transatlantic crossing represented by a blue pennant flown from the topmast of the ship. It was a creation of the transatlantic shipping companies in the 1860s for the publicity opportunities of possessing the fastest ship. There were separate awards for the fastest eastbound and westbound crossings. In 1930, see Harold Keats Hales, 1868-1942, a British politician and owner of Hales Brothers Shipping Company, initiated the trophy. The Hales Trophy is awarded on the basis of average speed, since the distance of transatlantic routes varies. Theoretically, the endpoints could be any port in the Canadian Maritimes or the eastern seaboard of the United States in the West and any port in Ireland, Britain, or Western Europe in the East. But traditionally, Routings considered for transatlantic records tend to involve service to or from New York City. The last superliner to hold the trophy was the SS United States, 
which set a time that was not beaten until 1990. The SS Great Western was awarded the Blue Ribbon for setting the record for transatlantic travel speed at 8.66 knots, 9.97 miles per hour, in 1837. In 1837, the new coastal steamer Sirius was temporarily hired for the transatlantic voyage, made the whole voyage under continuous steam power. She was chartered by the British and American Steam Navigation Company for the voyage with a view to beating the SS Great Western. The passage from Cork in Ireland to New York took 18 days and 10 hours at an average speed of 6.7 knots. This is the Sirius arriving in New York Harbor. This is the SS Great Western arriving in New York Harbor a short time later. The SS Great Western at the time was by far the largest steamship in the world at 236 feet, 72 meters, long. The size of the SS Great Western did not only allow for more bunker space but also more space for the passengers. Although the SS Great Western's huge boilers took up almost half its interior, the ship was designed to carry 148 passengers, with a main passenger saloon 75 feet long by 34 feet at its widest. The SS Great Western displaced 2,340 tons. The SS Great Western offered the finest amenities afloat so far. Her grand saloon was the most beautiful on the high seas. To summon a steward, all a passenger had to do was to pull a bell rope. Luxury was indeed working its way onto the ocean liners. After having made 64 crossings, the SS Great Western was laid up in late 1846. The following year, she was sold to the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company. She served the new company during nine rather uneventful years. In 1855, the SS Great Western was requisitioned by the British government for military use. Along with the RMS Great Britain and several Cunard and P&O paddle steamers, she was used as a troop transport in the Crimean War. Upon her return to commercial service, her owners no longer had much interest in her. Instead, the 18-year-old ship was sold for scrap in late 1856. Her last trip was to a salvage yard on the lower reaches of the Thames below London, where she was subsequently cut up. The Cunard Line, formerly Cunard White Star Line, is presently the cruise line that operates the RMS Queen Elizabeth II and RMS Queen Mary two ocean liners in 1838. The British government solicited bids to build a fleet of paddle-wheel steamships to deliver mail between the United States and England. The paddle-wheel steamers were to replace Britain's famous line of packet sailing ships. Canadian shipping magnate Samuel Cunard, along with engineer Robert Napier, and businessman James Donaldson, Sir George Burns and David MacIver formed the British and North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The company successfully bid on the rights to the mail shipping contract between England and America. Winning this entitled them to use the RMS, or Royal Mail Ship, identifier as part of their vessel's names. This is a cartoon that was part of a campaign by businessmen in the 1850s to win a cheaper transatlantic postage rate. In 1840, the company changed its name to Cunard Steamships Limited to provide transatlantic mail service between Liverpool, England and Boston, Massachusetts, twice a month. Business boomed and Cunard soon expanded its operations to include passenger service between the two countries. In 1840, Cunard Line's first steamship, the RMS Britannia, 
began its first regular passenger and cargo service by a steamship. Sailing from Liverpool to Boston. A voyage of 12 days, and 10 hours at an average speed of 8.5 knots. She carried 115 passengers and 89 crew and was 1,156 GRT. This was the beginning of the first ever regular passenger and cargo service by steamship. Despite some advantages offered by the steamships, clippers remain dominant. The first of the new class of FU new liners commissioned by Cunard was called the RMS Britannia. This started the tradition of how Cunard would name almost all of its ships in the future. All names would end with IA. And they should be Latin words for various parts of the world. The three near identical sisters of the RMS Britannia, which, of course, means Britain, or the Acadia, Nova Scotia, Caledonia Scotland and Columbia America. The Cunard RMS Britannia steams through a lane cut in the ice into Boston Harbor in the frigid winter of 1844. A Cunard poster from the late 1950s depicts the entire fleet at that time. The ships are in the front row. Coronia Mauritania Britannic Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. In the middle row. Ivernia. Saxonia Sylvania and Corinthia. And in the back row. Scythia Media and Parthia. Soon. Cunard's fleet had grown to 16 ships. Cunard faced many competitors from Britain. The United States and Germany but survived them all. This was mainly due to a great focus on safety. Cunard ships were usually not the largest or the fastest, but they earned a reputation for being the most reliable and the safest. The Prosperous Company eventually absorbed Canadian Northern Steamships Limited in Cunard's principal competitor, the White Star Line, owners of the ill-fated RMS Titanic. This is the RMS Aquitania of the Cunard Line. These are advertising posters for the Cunard Line. This is Cunard Line advertising their voyage of just five and one half days across the Atlantic. For more than a century and a half, Cunard dominated the Atlantic passenger trade and was one of the world's most important companies. Cunard ships played important roles in the development of the world economy and also participated in all of Britain's major wars, from Crimea to the Falklands War, where the Cunard container ship Atlantic conveyor was sunk by an Exocet missile. The Cunard line began to decline in the 1950s as speedy air travel began to replace ships as the primary transporters of passengers and mail across the Atlantic. Cunard tried to address this by forming a partnership with British Overseas Airways Corporation in 1962. BOC, Cunard Limited operated scheduled air services to North America the Caribbean and South America. But the operation was dissolved in 1966. For much of the late 20th century and for the first few years of the 21st century, the line's only vessel making transatlantic crossings was the RMS Queen Elizabeth II in 2004. The ship's service was limited to world cruises. And her transatlantic route was taken over by the new liner, the RMS Queen Mary II, the first ocean liner to be built in 30 years, and at the time the largest passenger liner ever built. In 1998, Cunard became one of several lines owned by Carnival Corporation. This ended the Cunard Line Company as a business entity. Nonetheless, the Cunard name still appears on the side of the RMS Queen Mary II. However, all aspects of ship itinerary, 
Operation and Manning are now controlled and provided by Princess Cruises, a subsidiary of Carnival Corporation. Some of the firsts accomplished by Cunard include the first transatlantic passenger service, RMS Britannia, 1840. The first passenger ship with electric lighting, SS Servia, 1881. The first twin screw ocean liner, RMS Campania, 1893. The first gymnasium and health center aboard a ship, RMS Franconia, 1911. The largest passenger ship, until 1911, the Mauritania, 1907. The largest passenger ship, until 1996, the Queen Elizabeth, 1940. And the largest passenger ship, until 2006, the RMS Queen Mary II, 2004. The screw propeller was first used in 1840 on the Art Committees. A river-going American steamer in 1843. Brunel went on to create the first liner to be made of iron and riven by a propeller. This was the SS Great Britain, and became the first propeller or screw-driven ship with an iron hull to cross the Atlantic. The SS Great Britain's propeller measured nearly 5 meters, 16 feet, in diameter and weighed more than 3 tons. The Great Britain was much larger than the SS Great Western at 322 feet, 98 meters, long, was 2,936 GRT and had a speed of 11 knots. More efficient propellers began to replace the bulkier paddle wheels found on earlier ocean liners. This is the ship with paddle wheels. This is a ship rolling in heavy seas. Here, the paddle wheels are too deep. Here, the paddle wheels are not deep enough. Now, this is just the right depth. Now with the screw propeller. The propeller is always underwater as the ship rolls. The SS Great Britain was launched in July 1843 and viewed by excited crowds at the Bristol waterfront. The SS Great Britain was run aground on the Irish coast, where she was battered by waves for 11 months but remained intact. A wooden hull ship would have been completely smashed by the waves over this long period of time. The inventors of the screw propeller are England's Francis Smith and the Swedish engineer John Ericsson. There were many patent designs for the screw propeller. The earliest screw propellers used on ships had two long, narrow blades, resembling the propellers of early aircraft. Soon, propellers with three, four, and even more blades were in use and ships carried two, three, or more propellers. Multiple propellers increased speed and provided alternatives in the event that one propeller malfunctioned or was lost. This is a ship's controllable pitch propeller. This is one of the two propellers of the SS Ariana. This variable pitch propeller weighs 32 tons and is 19 feet or 5.8 meters in diameter. The pitch is computer controlled for maximum performance at a speed of 24 knots or more. The SS Great Britain originally carried 120 first class passengers, 26 of whom were in single cabins. 132 second-class passengers and 130 officers and crew. However, when an extra deck was added, it increased the number of passengers to 730. Although initially intended as an Atlantic stormy, the SS Great Britain made most of her working voyages from the United Kingdom to Australia in 1852. She made her first voyage to Melbourne, Australia, 
carrying 630 emigrants. During her time, she was considered the most reliable of the emigrant ships between Britain and Australia. Between 1855 and 1858, the SS Great Britain was also used as a troop ship during the Crimean War and the Indian Mutiny in 1882. She was turned into a sailing ship to transport bulk coal. But after a fire on board in 1886, she was found on arrival at the Falkland Islands to be damaged beyond repair. The SS Great Britain was sold to the Falkland Islands Company and used there as a storage hulk until the 1930s when she was scuttled and abandoned. The SS Great Britain was then towed across the Atlantic Ocean back home to Bristol. She is now a Visito attraction and museum ship in Bristol Harbour with between 150,000 and 200,000 visitors annually. In 1970, the SS Great Britain was refloated on a pontoon and towed back to Bristol, where she was returned to the, then disused, dry dock, in which she had been built, for conservation as a museum ship. The return of the SS Great Britain to the port of Bristol in 1970, after a long working life and abandonment to the elements, is a remarkable testimony to the strength of its construction. Brunel turned to building a third ship in 1852, even larger than both of its predecessors and intended for voyages to India and Australia in 1858 Brunel built the SS Great Eastern, the first vessel with a double iron hull. This is the SS Great Eastern under construction in 1857. Brunel closely supervised the construction of the SS Great Eastern. The Little Giant, as he became known, closely supervised the construction and every launch attempt. The SS Great Eastern, originally dubbed Leviathan, was cutting-edge technology for its time, almost 700 feet, 213 meters, long. Fitted out with the most luxurious appointments and capable of carrying over 4,000 passengers. The SS Great Eastern was designed to be able to cruise under its own power non-stop from London to Sydney and back since engineers of the time were under the misapprehension that Australia had no coal reserves, and it remained the largest ship built until the turn of the century. Like many of Brunel's ambitious projects, the ship soon ran of a budget and behind schedule in the face of a series of momentous technical problems. The reason why the SS Great Eastern was so extremely large was that she was built for the run from Europe to Australia. Earlier steamers had to refuel in almost every harbour they passed. The SS Great Eastern was designed to make the entire trip without refueling until she reached Calcutta. Also, it wasn't a coincidence that SS Great Eastern had the length she had, 689 feet, 211 meters. A problem that had haunted captains and passengers throughout the times of seafaring was that a ship rolled because of the great waves hitting the hull. When the SS Great Eastern was constructed, it was made sure that she was longer than any wave ever measured. Even though this precaution was taken, the SS Great Eastern would become famous for her vomit-causing rolling. At the time of her launch in 1858, the SS Great Eastern at 19,000 tons was six times larger than any ship ever built. She would only be surpassed in length in 1899, by the SS Oceanic II, and in tonnage in 1901, by the SS Celtic II. Brunel knew her affectionately as the Great Babe. The SS Great Eastern was the first ship to incorporate the double-skinned hull, 
a feature which would not be seen again in a ship for 100 years, but which is now compulsory for reasons of safety. The SS Great Eastern Head Sail Paddle and Screw Propulsion The paddle wheels were 17 meters, 56 feet, in diameter, and the four-bladed screw propeller was 7.3 meters, 24 feet, across. The power came from four steam engines for the paddles and an additional engine for the propeller. Total power was estimated at 6 megawatts, 8,000 horsepower. Her maximum speed was 24 kilometers per hour, 13 knots or 15 miles per hour. She had six masts, but the sails turned out to be unusable at the same time as the paddles and screw, because the hot exhaust from the five funnels would set them on fire. The SS Great Eastern continued to be haunted with bad luck, and she never carried a full complement of passengers. The third voyage she made in eight and a quarter days was a record for her, but not enough to receive the blue ribbon in August 1862. The SS Great Eastern sailed with a record of paying passengers. 1,500 The ship has been portrayed as a white elephant. But it can be argued that in this case, Brunel's failure was principally one of economics, his ships we simply years ahead of their time. His vision and engineering innovations made the building of large-scale, screw-driven, all-metal steamships a practical reality. Still, the prevailing economic and industrial conditions meant it would be several decades before transoceanic steamship travel emerged as a viable industry. In 1865, the second transatlantic cable was to be laid out. The first had broken only after three weeks. And now a more trustworthy and solid one was required. And no ship in the world was big enough to carry this enormous cable. Except the SS Great Eastern. She was chartered by the Atlantic Telegraph Company. Large areas of the luxurious interior were removed to accommodate the big cable. She started her mission from Ireland. But after half the way, the cable broke and was lost in 6,000 feet of water. The following year, the SS Great Eastern tried again, and this time succeeded. On her way back, the SS Great Eastern found and picked up the previous cable. And when she returned, she had accomplished her mission and was still in possession of an excellent cable. Although a failure at its original purpose of passenger travel, it eventually found a role as an oceanic telegraph cable layer, and the SS Great Eastern remains one of the most important vessels in the history of shipbuilding. The SS Great Eastern was the only ship big enough to carry the vast amounts of cable needed. The transatlantic cable had been laid, meaning Europe and America now had a telecommunications link. She laid 4,200 kilometers, 2,600 statute miles, of the 1865 transatlantic telegraph cable and took part in similar operations before being broken up for scrap in 1889 and 1890. It took 18 months to take her apart. This was probably the only thing she was allowed to do because as a cable-laying ship, she was a success. However, the SS Faraday, a ship specially designed to handle cable-laying was launched in 1874. The SS Great Eastern was outdated, only to be bought and used as a floating advertising board. In 1888, the SS Great Eastern was sold to a scrapping firm for £16,000. These are the specifications of the SS Great Eastern. The SS Great Eastern, with its total displacement of 18,918 tons, 
was by far the largest ship built in the 19th century. With a double iron hull and two sets of engines driving both the screw and paddles, this Leviathan was never an economic success. Still, the SS Great Eastern admirably demonstrated the technical possibilities of the large iron steamship. By the end of the 19th century, steamships were well on their way to displacing sailing ships on all the main trade routes of the world. The SS Great Eastern proved a trendsetter. Following Brunel's lead, most shipbuilders constructed ships from large iron plates riveted together. Iron ships had stiffer hulls, which helped to reduce vibration from the movement of the long propeller shaft. But iron presented a new set of challenges to builders in that it was rigid, fractured easily, and rusted. Shipbuilders found an alternative in steel, which is stronger and easier to shape than iron. Steel's high cost and scarcity made it an impractical choice until 1855 when English inventor Henry Bessemer improved the steel refining process. The Bessemer process made good quality steel available at a fraction of its earlier price. By the end of the 19th century, most of the great merchant and battleships featured steel hulls. In 1845, the same year as Eislumberd Brunel's fabulous SS Great Britain entered service, an American shipping company entered the business. It was the Collins Line, which had been founded by the American Edward Knight Collins. Before entering the risky North Atlantic passenger business, Collins had operated a successful sailing packet company. Many thought him a daredevil to enter this kind of business. The name White Star first appeared in 1849, as the company the White Star Line of Boston Packets, in the 1850s. Gold was discovered in Australia, requiring many large ships to carry all the miners searching for fortune. And the company put their ships into the Australian trade. In 1869, the Nelson, Ismay and Company and White Star joined forces forming the new Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, also known as the White Star Line, a company that would become a very fabled one. In 1871, White Star Line's SS Oceanic set a new standard for ocean travel by placing the first-class cabin amidships, adding large portholes and offering running water and electricity. The 128-meter 420 feet, oceanic was steel hulled, propeller driven with auxiliary sails, and had a passenger deck with cabins lining the ship's sides rather than tucked below decks or in windowless inner compartments. The White Star Line did not spare any costs in achieving the most modern and beautiful ship upon the waves. The press noted the ship's appearance, which in their words, resembled an imperial yacht, the ship was made for a glorious future. But time would prove different. The SS Oceanic did not become the great success the managers of the White Star Line had hoped for, but she had set new standards in shipbuilding technique. And no passenger would any longer accept a new ship of the old breed. These are the specifications of the SS Oceanic. By the mid-1870s, the White Star Line had grown considerably since the company was founded 30 years early. The company was one of the most popular and respected of all operating on the North Atlantic. In 1871, the first SS Oceanic made her maiden voyage from Liverpool to New York. And she was soon followed by the SS Atlantic in 1873. And then two new sister ships, the SS Britannic and SS Germanic, in 1874. The Britannic was first intended to have the name Hellenic, but the name was changed before her launch. 
One can suspect that the two names given were thought to symbolize the friendship between Britain and Germany. The two new sisters represented the latest ship design. Yet they still bore much resemblance to the old sailing vessels. But the SS Britannic and her sister had many modern features as well. Fitted with eight bulkheads. Their iron hulls were divided into nine separate compartments. Making them very safe ships. The SS Britannic was also equipped with an adjustable propeller shaft to lower the propeller deeper into the open sea to improve its thrust. Although not the largest ship in the world, the SS Britannic was still the largest built so far by Harland and Wolf, with a gross tonnage of 5,004. To meet the competition, these two new ships were to be about 1.5 knots faster than White Star's first quartet. However, the competition was stiff. And other companies soon built ships to match White Star Line's quartet. To keep up with the pace, the company ordered new ships from the Belfast shipyard of Harland and Wolf. The SS Oceanic was the first ship to exceed the SS Great Eastern in length, although not tonnage. The building of this ship marked White Star's departure from competition and speed with its rivals. After that, White Star concentrated on comfort and economy of operation instead. In the late 19th century, shipbuilders discovered that when speed through water increased above about 20 knots, 23 miles per hour or 37 kilometers per hour, the required additional engine power increased exponentially. Each additional increment of speed needed a much larger increase in engine power and fuel consumption. With the coal-fired reciprocating steam engines of the time, exceeding about 24 knots, 28 mph or 44 km per hour, required very high power and fuel consumption. In early steam engines, steam from the boiler was directed to a cylinder where it drove the movement of a single piston before it was expelled. These single expansion engines wasted some of the steam's energy. More efficient double expansion engines used the steam expelled from one cylinder to power another cylinder. By 1873, the even more efficient triple expansion engines came into use. Here is an animation of a simplified triple expansion engine. High pressure steam red enters from the boiler and passes through the engine, exhausting as low pressure steam blue to the condenser. Passenger comfort in rough seas has always been a concern. This shows the invention of Henry Bessemer, who invented the Bessemer converter for making steel to minimize seasickness. The main cabin was suspended so that it would remain stationary while the hull rolled. The experiment was a failure because the main cabin rolled more than the ship did. Recommended Videos Ocean Liners, Part 1 Recommended Video, The Rise of the Ocean Liner, Evolution of Ocean Liners Documentary Part 1 Recommended Video the Rise of the Ocean Liner, Evolution of Ocean Liners Documentary Part 2 Recommended Video, Floating Palaces Volume 1, Ocean Liner Documentary Recommended Video, Floating Palaces Volume 2, Ocean Liner Documentary Recommended Video, Floating Palaces Volume 3, Ocean Liner Documentary Recommended Video, Floating Palaces Volume 4, Ocean Liner Documentary Recommended Video, Floating Palaces The Great Atlantic Ocean Liners Recommended Video, 15 Largest Ocean Liners in the World
Recommended Video, The Liners, Ships of Destiny, Episode 1, Maiden Voyage. Recommended Video, The Liners, Ships of Destiny, Episode 2, Ships of War. Recommended Video, The Liners, Ships of Destiny, Episode 3, The Great Duel. Recommended Video, The Liners, Ships of Destiny, Episode 4, Endless Voyage. Recommended Video, YouTube Navigation. Table of Contents, Ocean Liners, Part 1. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.